everyone, and welcome to the Book Lounge. Today, we are talking about Seven Principles for Making Marriage Work by Dr. John Gottman. Your hosts, as always, are myself, Corinne Ritchie. And me, Tom butler Bowden. Uh, so the general aim with Book Insights and the Book Lounge is to cover great nonfiction books that can help you in work or life or just expand your mind. Um, and as curator, I'll give my take on each book while I think it's still relevant um, and uh, also my highlights. Yep, and I will weigh in on the book, update you with latest news on the author and the title. Um, and as always, our Book Insights episodes are where you'll want to go for the really in-depth explorations of these nonfiction books. But here in the Book Lounge, it's just more of an informal chat on the book of the week. And new for this season, we're bringing guests into the Book Lounge to interview. Um, so really excited about today's guest. She is the author of five books on gender, family, and her book, Marriage, a History, was even cited in the U.S. Supreme Court decision on marriage equality. She has been featured sharing her expertise on Oprah, The Today Show, PBS NewsHour, NPR, many more. I don't know how Book Insights ended up on that list. I'm just glad that we're here. Please welcome <laughs> Stephanie Koontz. Hi, thank you. Thanks so much for being here. Yeah. Um, Stephanie, your, your book, Marriage, A History, um, How Love Conquered Marriage, it's, it's a bit of a classic now. And I think you go all the way back, you know, to the marriage of Antony and Cleopatra, <laughs> right up to the present day. Um, and you show in it how, how recent, really, the idea of marrying for love is, you know, compared to the stretch of human history. Um, so uh, th this is, so your take is a very sort of high level um, approach to marriage, where the book we're looking at today is almost like a, at the micro level how the, the nuts and bolts of good relationships. Um, but I just wondered what, um, how you were sort of led to the whole area of, of marriage and family in the first place. <laughs> well, it was kind of a long uh, journey. I started uh, back in the 1970s, I was asked to write a book about the history of women. And I started to write it. And at the time, there were all of these books that were either being written about what uh, has been done to women through the ages or what a few exceptional women have done. And I thought, well, I would like to bring women and men into interaction. And in, back in 1970s, um, there weren't many places you could see them in interaction. We weren't very well represented in the workforce in politics. And suddenly it was like, uh, duh, the family. So, but that was a very, very new field. Uh, so I spent 13 years writing my first book on the history of uh, the American family, which I now think you could title as pompous as you wanna be because I was trying to prove myself to academics and research the heck out of everything. And just as it uh, came, just after it came out, uh, I looked up and saw that the family had become this major political debate and people were talking about the traditional family. Uh, and both sides of the debate had no idea what the traditional family really was, since they usually thought it was the male breadwinner family, which is actually the least traditional family form and marriage form in history. So that led me into um, my next book, which was called The Way We Never Were, you know, Leave It to Beaver, not a documentary. <laughs> this is not, <laughs> this is not. And then as I researched more, I just became more and more interested in marriage. And mostly I started getting asking, getting questions from people like you about marriage. And I realized I didn't know enough about marriage to pop off about it. So I had to write my next book about marriage in order to do that. <laughs> That's great. That's perfect. So I would love to have like a little takeaway, something that our listeners would love to know, some, uh, something you can like quickly debunk, something, uh, a common misconception about marriage that you think is important for people to know. Oh my gosh, there's so many. <laughs> um, well, maybe I could be allowed to. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Uh, one is that, um, that marriage for love um, was, uh, you know, it was natural. That it, as one of my students once wrote in a book that nowadays people don't, um, don't take the marriage vowels very seriously, which I thought was such a cute mistake, you know, like I owe you. But actually the marriage vows were not taken seriously throughout most of history. When you go way back before Anthony and Cleopatra, marriage was really all about getting in-laws. Uh, it was about expanding your social uh, relationships. 
And in foraging societies, it was a way of making connections and sharing things. And then when you got into class societies like Anthony and Cleopatra, like you mentioned, uh, it was a way of consolidating, uh, making peace treaties, you know, signing uh, military alliances, uh, getting access to, to property and power. And it's really only in the last 200 years that we wanted it to be about love. And as we'll probably talk about later, our definitions of love have been changing very rapidly. Mm -hmm. The other big misconception is that uh, the male breadwinner family, that that was traditional. Through most of history, um, marriage was based on co-provider families. Uh, women were con you know, considered to be absolutely essential. And for despite all of the repression and oppression of women in history, as I do some new research for a new book I'm writing, I'm beginning to increasingly be convinced that it was only under the, the development of democracy and paternalism and more uh, friendly, you know, at least protective attitudes toward women, that women lost confidence in their essential identity as workers and began instead to see themselves as people who provided love. Uh, and so that's, I think, a really interesting thing to think about, that this is not built into the female psyche, that we're the ones who take care of love and that's, and, and that work is like this conflict. For thousands of years, work-family conflict would have been uh, incomprehensible to mm. women. That's really fascinating. Mm. Amazing. Um, so um, the, the book we're talking about, um, Seven Principles for Making Marriage Work, I mean, just before we sort of dive into the, the book and the details, where do you see this book in terms of, you know, the history of marriage? Do you see it as a sort of very conservative approach to marriage or was it quite sort of groundbreaking and in its sort of research focus? Oh, I think it was pretty much groundbreaking. I think it was typical of the changes that we've been struggling with now since, um, since the 70s, as women entered the workplace and as we expected more equality of marriage. You know, we expected love before, but you know, the idea of love as late as the 1960s, I think it was just kind of based upon living up to standards of this is what a man does and this is what a woman does, you know. Uh, my wife, you know, I can't explain my work to her, but oh, she's such a good mom. And, and my husband, he doesn't understand my emotions, but oh, you know, he's a good provider. Well, we've changed these, these and we're beginning to try to work through what it means. Um, and so I think John Gottman was one of a whole series of important books that help us look at the evolution and figure out and think about how we can develop more uh, respectful marriages, marriages that do take into account uh, the, the growing desire for friendship and, and equality. So I think that, that, that it was very important that way. Mm -hmm. Got it. Um, so I guess uh, to frame the Gottman's book, um, it, I, in my mind, what it may, what it, it sort of stood out because it was data driven. Um, so he set up a whole lab and worked with his wife, um, Nan Silver, to bring this more, um, I guess, statistical approach uh, to marriage and uh, seeing the micro interactions. So he set up this lab where they could watch um, couples behind a screen, how they actually interacted and even what happened when they had fights, et cetera. And then all this research led to him claiming that he had over a 90% success rate in predicting within the first three minutes of observing an argument, whether a couple would stay together. Um, and he, he quite this um, great analogy, the four horsemen of the apocalypse in relationships is criticism, contempt, defensiveness and stonewalling. So these, um, these activities come into every or most arguments, but the result is that they can sort of poison a, a relationship forever. Um, so this is quite a, quite a novel approach to, uh, to relationships. Um, yeah. yeah. Did you, um, what, what did you think, Stephanie, about this this idea, firstly, about the 
you know, the success rate of predicting um, marital failure? Well, you know, we, we, we don't have any real long-term studies of whether this could happen or not. Uh, and so I would take the, the claim with a little grain of salt. And I'm saying this with the greatest respect. I know John Gottman, I admire his work. I, I've, I often talk about his uh, discussion of the things that he observed uh, when he was doing these uh, kind of bed and breakfast wired for sound <laughs> ideas about uh, men and women uh, and talk about what he calls bids for connection in my own marriage. I often think of as bids for attention uh, and we can come back to that. Uh, so this is not said with the greatest respect, but I am, if you see a really hard argument and people are behaving this way, I think it's probably uh, fair to say that judging from his retrospective experiences, that is a, an indication of trouble in the marriage. Uh, on the other hand, many people have implied that uh, you can look at the way they interact and then decide whether the marriage is gonna be good or not. And also I think that you have to take into account that people are under stress at different times. And uh, as J Gottman himself points out, good communication is not necessarily the, you know, the, the end all and be all. And as people like um, Ben Carney and John Bradbury have pointed out, under stress, even people with really loving relationships and good backgrounds can really uh, deteriorate, especially when it's chronic economic stress. So I just think that we need to, to take, I think we should absorb these principles, but I always worry when people take these advice books based on averages and longitudinal studies as like God, God given markers, you know, oh my God, we're, we're going to have divorce because this happened or, oh my gosh, if I do this, this will save the marriage. As a historian, uh, I found that it's very useful to me to, to look at these kinds of things, but also to look at what are the social circumstances that are in my relationship with my husband, with my child, whatever it is, and ask, why are these behaviors coming out now? And sometimes that can allow you to step back from the pressures and solve them. Um, so, so I just, I think everybody needs to take these sorts of things with a little grain of salt. Um, but I'm very much like uh, the kind of principles that he puts out and they're very helpful to people as they work through their conflicts and prevent themselves from doing really, you know, stuff that can be destructive. But let me give you just one example. For example, um, Lots and lo loads of research shows that there's this pattern uh, connected to stonewalling of demand withdrawal. Uh, someone in the relationship wants something to change, and it's usually the she, because uh, she has more to change given the history of male-female relationships, and she's pressing for that, and the other person is withdrawing, withdrawing, withdrawing. This is a really bad uh, syndrome, and it predicts very bad outcomes for middle class or ordinarily stable couples. But again, research with low income couples or couples uh, who, where the man is under, uh, for example, tremendous pressure in his job, like air traffic controller, that sort of thing. If you can't, if you're not in a position where you can answer the demand, I can't be more available to you. I can't get rid of this thing. Then withdrawal may be actually protective to the marriage. So people have to take into account changing socioeconomic and personal circumstances. That's all I would say. Interesting. So it's really taking a more uh, global view of not just the issue at hand, but the, the bigger picture of the people and the society, the community, that whole thing, taking all that into account. And understanding where those things come from. John Snary mm -hmm. did a really interesting study of um, people who had, of men who had had really bad fathers in their lives. And one of the interesting things he found was that the ones who had been able to go on and be good fathers themselves, the best predictive factor was if they had stepped back from their own pain about the father and begun to understand why their father might have behaved that way, not necessarily to forgive it, but to understand it and to say to themselves, okay, I won't replicate that. And I think as, you know, as a historian, maybe I'm just, you know, pushing too much for, for my own field. I think that sometimes history uh, helps you understand that it's the situation, not always the psyche that mm -hmm. is at 
all. And then maybe you can move forward using advice like that of Gottman, but using it in the context of saying, oh, I know why he did that, or I know why I did that. And it's not because I'm a bad person or he's a bad person. Interesting. So pairing the psychological and the social and then really coming up with an innovative solution. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, let's go back to the to Gottman's actual seven principles. Um, if you want to get them in detail, listen to the actual Book Insight episode, but they are number one, enhance your love map, which we can talk about. Two, nurture fondness and affection. Three, turn, away, turn toward each other instead of away. Four, let your partner influence you. Five, solve your solvable problems. Six, overcome gridlock. And seven, create shared meaning. Um, now, he also talk, he begins a book, I think, talking about marriage myths. And one of them I thought was interesting is that um, the myth that all arguments between spouses are resolvable. Um, he found that 70% of marital problems could be defined as chronic or perpetual. Um, and he says that unrequited dreams are at the core of every gridlocked conflict. So I think he's saying that there are things you, you'll probably never solve. Um, like, you know, one person wants to live in one country, another one wants to live in another or even another state or, or something to do with religion, perhaps. So, but, but you, at the very least, you need to understand each person's point of view or dreams. Because if you just try to shut out that, um, that's really a recipe for, a, you know, a spiraling marriage downhill. Yeah, I think that's one of my favorites is solve your solvable problems and just sort of dispelling that myth that, well, everything's solvable. If you just keep talking about your feelings, eventually you're going to iron it all out and everything will be great. And having been married for 13 years, I'm like, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> but on the other hand, something that I think is really important is that there's just no substitute for finding out what are the insoluble problems before you get married mm -hmm. and deciding whether you can live with them or not. Yep. Um, you know, one of the things that, that I think that some research shows, and that is that actually one of the really important predictors of how people get along is not how much things uh, they share in terms of what they like, but how many things they share and what they hate. Mm -hmm. You know, for example, my husband and I come from a political background where racism and, um, you know, certain kinds of politics are absolutely unacceptable. We could not be married to someone, you know, to another person who didn't share that, you know, disdain for that kind of um, political outlook. And so, you know, it really does, it really is, it, it's very important to realize that some insoluble problems may be good reasons to split, that they will cause you such um, eventual contempt for, for the other person that you might as well get out before you start um, <laughs> arguing yeah. much. <laughs> no, that's, that's great advice. So you gave an example of, you know, something that you really hate that you need, that needs to be sort of a deal breaker. Um, for anybody listening, what are some other deal breakers that you think you should be aware of? If somebody's, you know, on the fence about, is this sort of, is this not the one? Um, what are some that you think uh, should be looked out for because they're going to be insolvable? Well, I think that the really depends on individuals. And in that sense, you know, I've never, um, my husband and I are not much for, you know, talking things through. I mean, neither of us would ever go through our love map with each other. <laughs> but, but I do think that um, staying, being in touch with your own personal map and then making sure that you're going in the same direction <laughs> as the person uh, rather than thinking that you're going to change him or mm -hmm. her. Uh, or I think that there's often a tendency because of a long history of, the, our, of what I think of as the first draft of the love match where we tried to develop love but on the basis of tremendous gender stereotypes where women would sort of be, you know, fall in love with the, with the idea that this guy was stronger and a little more dangerous, you know, the, ro the romance, the erotic fantasies from Jane Eyre to Fifty Shades of Grey, you know, <laughs> oh, this guy could hurt me, but uh, if I'm just female enough, he'll protect me instead, you know, uh, and men, of course, I'm much more, 
I'm, I'm much more um, sympathetic than many of my feminist friends are to mansplaining because men were told for years that, okay, you have to explain you. That's what makes you loved is that you're wiser and smarter and you're gonna educate this, this woman. So for years, we would try to, to kind of combine those with, with equality. And I think that people have to be really sh uh, clear about whether that's, whether those things that still trigger that those early erotic, um, in, in, you know, indoctrination that we got, uh, they still make it, oh, oh, isn't he cute? You know, oh, he's a little scary or isn't she, you know, isn't she charming? She, she defers, you know, she so adores me so much. Uh, do you wanna live with that for the rest of your life? I think that that's really good because most, most people nowadays uh, do want a much more egalitarian, respectful, uh, and they might get tired of the, the cutesy stuff or the protective stuff after a while. Interesting, <laughs> you would yeah. The, the idea that you should marry your best friend, um, is that a good basis for a partnership? Well, it depends how you define best friends. I, for example, um, don't know. I, I, I think I would prefer spending more time with my husband than... Um, then at long periods of time, I and mean, we, we travel together well, that sort of thing. But um, he, the, I, I really firmly um, subscribe emotionally to what a lot of research shows, and that is that you don't want to over-specialize. I mean, you don't want to over-generalize uh, with friendship. You don't want to try to get everything from one friend. People mm -hmm. who try to divide it up. Oh, I get emotional support from these two friends and I get raw cheerleading from another and I get intellectual challenge from another. So I think that if you expect your partner to give you all of that, that um, that's probably not the best idea, but certainly someone that you truly, truly like. Uh, you know, let me, let me give you a good example. Um, when I first read uh, one of Gottman's findings about these bids for connection, uh, and he found that, and, and, and that is for your people who haven't seen your longer explanation of it, it's, he found that one of the best predictors of long-term conflict or, and long-term satisfaction in a relationship was not how they fought or how much they exchanged intimacies. It's how they responded to daily little bids for connection, as he calls it. You know, like somebody says, oh, look at, look at that boat out there. And the other person, he had his graduate students code it and it wasn't a very complex coding. It was like, um, let's see, is it a negative, a neutral or positive? So negative would be, I'm trying to, I'm trying to read here. Uh, neutral would be, uh-huh. And positive would be, oh yeah, okay. Look at, look at that boat out there. You know, hey, shouldn't we go, remember the time that we did this? You know, that sort of thing. So he read that, I read that and he said that like, I forget exactly the percentages, but that if you responded positively 85% of the time, you were like golden. And if you responded negatively a certain amount of time, you were dead. Well, here am I, I'm a researcher and I tend to just completely immerse myself in um, these books and I get very, um, it, and my husband is the jack of all trades and he reads all sorts of things. And um, so sometimes he will, laugh while he's reading the newspaper, uh, which I call a bid for attention or connection or whatever. And sometimes if I'm working, I wouldn't respond. Well, after Gottman, I tried to really respond to every single one. You know? <laughs> and I realized, you know, fortunately, I am so confident in my husband's respect for my work that most of the time I respond because I know that it will be very funny or that it will be very useful to me. You know, I mean, he reads obituaries and if he says, oh boy, listen to this, actually I'll probably be able to use it, you know, in my books. So mm -hmm. I respond favorably. So I was asking myself, if you didn't respond favorably already 75% of the time, just naturally because you know that he wouldn't interrupt you, could you really up it a lot? You know, I mean, pretty soon I'd be going, <laughs> Oh, what, you know, and, and he knew very well that I was like trying to, to patronize him. So mm -hmm. that's my sense of what you want from a, a, a friend. 
you want someone that you trust that you don't have to work at mm-hmm. to be patient with. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, stuck in here in the house, I get a lot of my husband being like, look at that beautiful bird. And I that's like, shall I keep working? All right, I'll look at the bird. Let's do it. Here we go. Where's the bird? <laughs> you know. Right, right. <laughs> but if you did it every five minutes. Right. Right, <laughs> right. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so yeah, those those are a couple of myths we've looked at. Um, he, I guess, for a lot of the book, um, Gottman talks about the marriage killers, um, which he's probably done his his most of his research on. So specifically, what happens at the start of arguments, um, how they begin, and how the other person responds to them. Um, so. If someone says something and the and the other partner sneers or rolls their other eyes or or mocks or something, um, then that makes you feel you you start to have a physiological reaction and which is almost like the physical reaction you get from fear and and stress, you know, in nature. So it's he's very interesting, I think, on on this how the emotions create these physiological responses in us. And his point is that every couple in a healthy relationship will have, you know, occasional fierce arguments or whatever. But the problem is when it becomes habitual, then one or both partners will start to live in a state of stress. And and when that happens, that's really, it's just a matter of time before it falls apart. Yeah, I believe in Gottman calls it flooding, where you have those physiological responses to just a, a discussion, an argument, whatever, where your blood pressure, your heart rate, your uh, you might start sweating, all of those kinds of things happen. And he's, he talks about when you are flooded that way, it's impossible to have a really um, constructive, you know, productive conversation. And um, that one kind of ties into this other book called The Five Keys to Mindful Communication. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that one. I love that book. Um, It's not a marriage book. It's literally just about communicating. You can use it with anyone. She talks a lot about that same idea of uh, she uses like the red light, yellow light, green light analogy for when you're in that discussion or argument and you can feel those physiological responses to acknowledge, oh, I'm not at a green light anymore. I'm not casually, calmly just sort of chit-chatting or talking. I Maybe I'm at a yellow light. Maybe I need to be aware that this is getting to a point where I'm starting to feel myself uh, respond physically and I'm not going to, it's not going to go well. So now's the time to start sort of, you know, calming down or backing out, or maybe let's take a break. Because once you get to that red light point where you are physiologically flooded, that's where nothing productive is going to happen. It's time to just put the brakes on and, you know, abandon ship. Yeah, I, I, I completely agree. I think these are all very good techniques. The only thing I would say, because sometimes I get calls from or emails from people who are trying to um, put into practice every little thing that they read in an advice book. And I would say it's kind of like a salad in ingredients, you know? <laughs> uh, now, I don't know where I'm going with this analogy, but uh, I'll push it for a minute. Uh, you know, there are things, some things you don't want to put in a salad, you know? <laughs> but there are a lot of things you can put in a salad. And so if you're missing one ingredient or you want to add another one that fits your taste, I think that's important. Uh, let, uh, another example, um, and I'm sh- I know that John Gottman would agree with this. Um, you know, he talks about, um, soft startup and lots of research talks about you know not you know not making the person feel too defensive on the other hand if you have a partner who has a really severe problem uh, and is in denial about it soft startups may just allow that person to feel okay and you won't have a bad big fight but also he or she will not change the behavior so sometimes you need to know when not to add a particular ingredient or to follow a particular kind of thing. And I think that's so important that people don't, that people use these things the, the way a good cook uses a recipe, that I'll follow what's working for me and my partner, and I'm not going to feel bad about when I decide that I need to vary. 
Yeah, definitely. Well, and I think a lot of what uh, you had stated and what we talk about in the book Insight and in Gottman's book is that basic foundation of mutual respect. Like if you don't have that foundation, then, and like you said, if there's major issues of like addiction, abuse, um, adultery, any of those kind of major issues, to use your cook analogy, like you can use the best recipe ever, but if the fish is rotten, then, you know, there's nothing that can be done to salvage it. No recipe can help you, you know? So we kind of have to start with the assumption of like those major areas are not on fire, basically. Right. And, you know, there's another one that I want to get at, though, because uh, this research has been coming in since John wrote that book. And uh, again, I know that he would agree with it. But we're finding uh, that a really important change uh, just in the last 15, 20 years uh, in terms of what uh, leads to uh, marital satisfaction. Um, and that is this question of egalitarianism in childcare and, um, and housework. And it's a really interesting change because a bunch of researchers did a study based on uh, a 1992 longitudinal study of couples. And uh, they came to this conclusion that couples who had a non-traditional division of labor where they shared the housework and childcare were actually less satisfied than ones who had a traditional one. And they had less uh, satisfactory sex lives. And so there was a big headline in the New York Times and elsewhere about, oh, the, the equal but sexless marriage. Well, you know, many researchers said, well, yeah, okay, but data collected in 1992 would be from marriages in the 60s, 70s, and 80s when people did not have the same values for the most part that they have today. So let's only look. And so uh, several researchers um, did a study where they only studied marriages formed since, the ni since 1990, mm -hmm. and they found the exact opposite that uh, the ones who reporting the highest sexual satisfaction and marital satisfaction uh, were those who, who most evenly shared uh, these kinds of things. And then a further follow-up found that the, uh, and this is a little tip that, that people might wanna, wanna know, that when you look at what, what about the sharing makes women and men happiest, men are happiest when the shopping is shared. Uh, not when the woman does it all or not when they do it all. That's a real good predictor of satisfaction. And I suspect it has to do with trust because in the old days, a woman didn't trust a man to, to do the shopping, you know? <laughs> um, and for, the, for a woman, it's sharing the, um, the dishes that, that have to be done after dinner. And boy, when that's not shared, uh, she reports higher conflict, even physical conflict in the relationship. So that's another little trick that you don't need to practice at home. Uh, internally, you can just practice it um, externally by doing the dishes. That's <laughs> great. <sharing> shopping. <laughs> yeah, a little shopping, little dishes. Sounds doable. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. So it seems that, I mean, I think from your books and so on, um, Stephanie, you take a sort of the idea that marriage has never been really that traditional and it's, um, there's, there's many forms that it can take. Um, and obviously with, with uh, the work-life balance, everything, it's all changing still. Do you still see marriage as being in a state of flux or do you think we've got to a point where each side in a relationship sort of knows what to expect and what the other person should be contributing, etc. Um, I think that we're still we're still changing. I think that, you know there have been tremendous change that that men are stepping up to the plate more in terms of housework and childcare. But on the other hand, this pandemic has certainly shown that these old habits. Um, it's hard to to. One of the most interesting uh, studies from it uh, is after the pandemic started, men who were already doing housework and childcare really did increase their housework and childcare. The relationships between the partners got much more egalitarian, except for those partners who uh, had to do homeschooling. Um, the homeschooling, which was a new thing, and the men had never had any practice on, 
Uh, and the women have all these old tapes in our minds saying, we're the experts, we're the ones who figure out what needs to be done. Uh, both partners then basically said, the woman needs to do the homeschooling. And it's become almost unbearable in many, many families as a result. Uh, so we've made progress, but women have to, to really work on, on what some sociologists call gatekeeping, the idea that we want the guy to help, but we don't expect, uh, we expect him to acknowledge that we're the expert and he's only our helper. And men of course have to acknowledge, have to understand that they have for years ignored the emotional and intellectual planning work that uh, lies behind these kinds of collaborations and really not notice that that is a form of labor in itself that they have to do. They can't just wait around and ask for instructions, you know. Oh, I'm glad to help. Tell me what to do. <laughs> That's a problem. It's true. It sounds like it sounds so helpful to say, just tell me what to do. But what it is actually doing is like pushing work onto you of like, assign me, tell me you're the boss. And yeah, it is. It's that's exactly. It's like when we're teaching our children how to do things, we, you know, it actually takes us more time than doing it uh, ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, we shouldn't have to do that with our husbands. <laughs> yeah. Um, and um, there was one other um, uh, thing to do with marriages that he says is um, a myth. I thought it was interesting which is uh, that you don't have to share common interests, um, that happy marriages can involve couples with very different temperaments, styles, and beliefs. I mean, in an age when, you know, online dating, etc., can find someone who is, at least on paper, an extremely good match for you in terms of interests. Um, Stephanie, do you still think that this idea of sharing common interests is a myth, or do you think it's actually more important than Gottman suggests? Well, I'm, you know, I don't, I'm not a psychologist and I don't want to play one on TV, you know, I wouldn't, so I don't know how to, I, I wouldn't, I don't feel confident to, 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 to pass an opinion on that. I would say that I think that probably in a common sense way, uh, it depends what interests you're talking about. Again, you know, that, that um, we talked earlier about likes and dislikes. You know, if somebody has an interest in doing stuff that I find repulsive, uh, that probably uh, would be a little bit of a problem. On the other hand, uh, if I love to, to cook as I do in my relationship and um, my husband likes to read The New Yorker, we work it out that he reads to me um, and to other New York Times and the New Yorker while I'm cooking dinner and we share a glass of wine, totally different interests, you know? Um, but so, so I, I think that he's, he's right, that there, this idea that you have to like everything and do everything together is, is absolutely wrong. And that's one good reason why uh, you should have friends other than your, your mate, <laughs> that you can do the things you enjoy doing with, along with them. I, for example, love to go mushroom hunting. Uh, and I have uh, two male friends and one female friend that I go mushroom hunting while my husband stays home and, and does his gardening work, you know? So uh, we have different interests there. That's yeah. a new one. I'm not familiar with mushroom hunting. Interesting. Oh, mushrooms, very fun. But mm. but you got to go with somebody who knows because they say there are old mushroom hunters and bold mushroom hunters, but no old bold mushroom hunters. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> that's, yeah. that's great. Yeah, one of the quotes that I really liked from um, the seven principles for making marriage work was um, understand the bottom line difference that's causing the conflict and learn how to live with it by honoring and respecting each other. So as we're talking about sort of the differences and in interests and things, um, I think I find that really inspiring and just um, it's just such a positive idea that like there are going to be those bottom line differences, but as long as you can honor and respect each other's differences, like you said, where, you know, I'm not going to nag you to come cook with me if that's not your interest. And he's not going to be like, who cares what we eat? Just listen to this. You know, it's, it's honoring and respecting those differences, big ones, little ones, all of that kind of thing. Right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so 
I mean, I said before, like my my what stood out for me in the book is the sort of data driven approach to marriage. Um, I think he's sort of Gottman laid a good foundation there. Um, but he's I believe he's written 40 books or something. Um, Corinne, is, do you have an update about, you know, his latest doings? Yeah. So today, if you Google Einstein of love, Gottman comes up. So he has now been uh, stamped with the moniker, John, you know, Dr. John Gottman is the Einstein of love. Um, like you said, he's written over 40 books, including um, this one that we're talking about today. So Seven Principles for Making Marriage Work was his best selling book back in 1999 is when it came out. Um, his most recent one is The Science of Couples and Family Therapy. And he's uh, pretty much by this point spent over like 35 years, you know, on this breakthrough research, which has won him all these different awards. And he was voted one of the top 10 most influential therapists of the past quarter century by psycho the Psychotherapy Networker. Um, yeah, and so today he's an award-winning speaker, author, professor emeritus in psychology. And as far as I understand, he is out in the DR, in the Dominican Republic. Oh, okay. Can I, can, I, can I also suggest that people who are really interested in this, there's some wonderful work going on in UCLA. They have a lab where they're doing really interesting scientific study and people might want to look up the work of uh, Ben Carney and Tom Bradbury and Andrew Christensen, whose book Reconcilable Differences I found very useful. Uh, mm -hmm dealing with my son, for example. Mm. Um, but um, yes, so, so there are lots of people doing uh, scientific work on this. And the more that, um, the more that we encourage a, a wide variety, it's, it's, it's great. I'm glad you're doing this. Yeah, awesome. and Stephanie, you have a, a, a book uh, you're writing or that's coming out, I believe? Well, uh, it's, it's not quite coming out yet, uh, and I got slowed down because my son and daughter-in-law just produced my first grandchild. And oh, that's congrats! A priority. Um, but I did just before, uh, just before they told me they were pregnant and I was supposed to come down and quarantine with them, uh, <laughs> I had signed a contract for a book um, with, of essays that we're calling um, For Better and for Worse, uh, The Problematic Past and Uncertain Future of Marriage. So. <laughs> So I'm sort of like torn between them. Baby comes first, but I'll get back to the book soon. <laughs> Very exciting. And now's the point in the show where we rate our, uh, our book of the week. So um, Stephanie, what do you rate this uh, John Gottman book, Seven Principles? Oh, one I, to five. I hate to be asked that. You know, I'm a <laughs> teacher. I, I never give fives, but, <laughs> but how about four and a half? <laughs> there you go. High marks. That's pretty good. Uh, and, and, and why why four and a half? What do you think? Well, I think that uh, John has done some really, really good work. Um, and, but I think that his findings should be combined with the UCLA lab on marriage. And so I think that the more, the less people think that there's one person who knows it all about marriage. And the more people are encouraged to look at a wide range of scientific studies, uh, the better off we'll all be. And I would say that about my own work too. Don't rely on me for the only person about the history of marriage. <laughs> mm. yeah. That's great. So maybe not just one Einstein of love, but put all the Einsteins together and see what you get. Have a collaboration and and even arguments and debates because there are uh, real good, interesting uh, science-based debates that are that aren't right or wrong on either side, but mm. that that help us understand the complexities. Mm. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, yeah, what do you think, Tom? Uh, I'll give it a four because um, I think it's one of the the better um, books in this whole genre. Genre. I read a few. Um, and um, I think the, the, data, the data approach just provides a good foundation um, so that, um, you know, in 30 years time, we'll all be uh, finding our perfect mates through <laughs> 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 algorithms and so on. Um, we'll look back on this as one of the sort of early good contributions to it. And he, uh, it's, it's very well written too. Like it's, um, it's, it's pretty enjoyable to read as well. Agreed. Yeah, I, I give this one a five because I, I found it enjoyable and useful. Like that's to me, that's what I'm looking for is, you know, especially when you add in the icing on the cake of like the science, the data driven, the years and decades of, of uh, proof and 
um, and the stories that are engaging that I, I love to learn from and be inspired by and just the normalization of so many things that you see in marriage and going, oh, everybody deals with this in some way, shape or form, uh, I find really validating. So yeah, I loved this one, thought it was great. So yeah, mm -hmm. high marks for me as well. Yeah, um, so Stephanie, thank you very much for joining us. Um, it's been fascinating having a real um, expert and someone who's written a, a lot in this subject. Um, for people watching or listening, um, uh, you find Stephanie website, all her books are on Amazon, um, a website, I believe. Um, so please do check her out and we'll have all that information in the show notes as well. That's right. Yeah, Stephanie, anything you want to leave with our listeners or viewers on how to connect with you or any new projects or anything like that? Um, well, um, I'm, I'm on, I have a place on Facebook where I post articles that I write and uh, you can follow there if you're interested. And I also have a website, stephaniekoons.com. Um, so feel free to, to write in or, or whatever. Uh, <laughs> as I say, for the next six weeks, I'm going to be quarantined down in Oakland when my son, who's a physician, has to go back to work in the midst of COVID-19. So I'll be helping out with this baby. Um, but I'll try to be available to people who write to me. <laughs> oh, very nice. Very nice. And I'm not far from Oakland. I might see you at the grocery store. I'll just be in a mask. So try just look for this. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I'll be allowed to be in a mask, uh, to, to go even go to the grocery store. Oh, I see. I see. <laughs> <laughs> but we can wave at, at, at another time. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Sounds good. Well, thank you so much. It's such an honor to have you on our show. Really appreciate you being here. Oh, it was, a, so it was a very fun conversation. Thanks for having me on. All right. And so for our listeners or watchers on our YouTube channel, thank you guys for joining us and stay tuned. Next week, we'll be back with a new book insight of the week. Um, so be sure to catch that. And as always, you can listen to all of the book insights, over 100 that we have at memo.com slash insights. Thanks for joining us. Hope you'll join us again next time. Mm -hmm.